Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is uh, Toshiko Takenaka. I'm a professor at the University of Washington School of Law. The budget background behind me is the University of Washington campus. Campus should look like this way at this moment, but uh, Seattle is uh, pretty much being locked down. So therefore, although today is the biggest day for Americans, Thanksgiving holiday, uh, but uh, government discouraged uh, people to have a party. So we stayed uh, uh, all day, uh, but the good to have a, a very exciting event today, uh, tonight, uh, from my side. Uh, and I would like to introduce a very distinguished speaker as well as a good friend for me, as well as Professor Kimijima Yuko, uh, Dr. Matthias Stegen. And Dr. Matthias Stegen is presiding judge at the Regional Court of Munich first, and I have already circulated his resume, so therefore, you know, please read his background. But uh, that there is formal, but I just want to say thank you, Matthias, for giving me an opportunity to visit your court and learning about the practice at their court. So it was a very wonderful uh, opportunity. And since then, uh, I go back to Munich every uh, fall this time of the year, although of course, you know, uh, I could not go this year, but the good to have this Zoom meeting uh, as a compensation for not able to meet each other in person. So the topic today is a very, very, uh, um, uh, very, very sort of exciting, timely topic. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a very distinguished uh, uh, participants as well as observers, some are uh, uh, judges as well as my colleague, Professor Yuko Kimijima, uh, uh, Professor uh, Suzuki, Professor Nakayama, Professor Tamura uh, from a leading Japanese university joining us as well as industry experts, uh, government experts. Uh, but, uh, uh, so many people I want to introduce, but time is limited. Uh, so therefore, uh, without any delay, uh, Matthias, please start your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Toshiki, uh, Toshiko, for um, the kind introduction and um, first of all for the invitation to speak today. It is a pleasure. And it is a quite interesting topic um, I had been asked to talk about. And uh, the um, discussion is still moving on. So um, it is kind of a um, yeah, picture of the moment of this very second of the discussion. So uh, nothing is for granted. Um, maybe some, um, some basic um, judgments had been rendered by the Federal Court of Justice. Um, some only recently on Tuesday, um, but uh, the discussion is still going on. I will return to this point uh, in a second. So uh, let me um, move to my presentation. I hope it goes again. Yeah, here it is. And uh, before I start, uh, a little disclaimer. Uh, that this lecture reflects my personal opinion only and not the opinion of the regional court Munich one. And uh, please do not present this presentation in court proceedings at, as has been done before. Um, um, what are we going to talk about um, today? Um, for me, it's the morning. For some of you, it's the afternoon. And um, for others, it's... Uh, late at night, but I hope the topic is fascinating enough uh, to um, keep you uh, watching. Um, first of all, the position of the objection, um, the, the friend defense within the infringement proceedings. 
Um, the def defendants qualified willingness to license and the effects of its absence. The antitrust compulsory license objections derived from a supplier and proportionality issues which come with uh, the injunctive relief. So the, this is the case law. Basically, we have at the moment um, regarding Germany after the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, rendered the Huawei versus CTE judgment. So we went off with the Munich guidelines on handling the antitrust compulsory license and you see the link. It had been translated into English as well. And then we had the first judgment of the Federal Court of Justice handed down in May called Friend Objection 1. The Regional Court of Mannheim then uh, rendered two decisions um, injuncting the defendant. Uh, then the Munich Court uh, rendered two decisions, one by the 7th Division, which is my division, and one of the 21st Division, which is the parallel sister division. Um, the Regional Court of Mannheim issued uh, on um, the 10th of October a opinion by the Mannheim 7th Division, um, which discloses opinions of the court diverging from Mannheim's second division. Um, it has not been published yet, but I have a copy in German. And um, they basically um, are of an opposite uh, opinion than the second division of Mannheim. Uh, this is not the case in Munich. In Munich, both divisions have basically the same opinions how to handle these cases. I will refer to this uh, in a second. Um, then we had two further judgments by the Regional Court Munich One, uh, also injuncting the, uh, the defendant. Um, and in between, we had two decisions by the Higher Regional Court on appeal uh, concerning the stay of provisional enforcement of these judgments of the 21st Division on various reasons. Uh, one reason was that they were not, not happy with the decision not to stay in respect to the um, nullity proceedings. And the, the other one was that they were not happy with the calculation of the bond to be posted um, prior, for, uh, prior to provisional enforcement of the judgment. And then very, very recently, we have a, a second decision by the Federal Court of Justice from Tuesday. Uh, called Friend Objection 2, which is also the party Siswell versus Hire. And there it is uh, told, uh, there are no written reasons yet. It is told that uh, the oral uh, reasons um, were, were a kind of confirming the first decision and even going a step further and um, from my point of view, confirming the Munich approach in handling these cases. And then um, the very recent uh, thing that happened was that the 4C division of the regional court in Dusseldorf made a referral to the U European Court of Justice asking for guidance uh, in particular in a connection with the problems that emerge when we have suppliers of the defendant. So first of all, the position of the objection within the infringement proceedings. Uh, I think this is um, more often than not, not in the mind of the people who discuss these issues. Uh, so our focus as an infringement court 
um, is not only on the friend objection, but we have some more issues to deal with. So first of all, the plaintiff has to demonstrate that we, the court, have jurisdiction, that he has an entitlement to the patent, he has a right to sue, the defendant has a right to be sued, um, we need a claim construction supporting the action, um, we need a proof for the use of the claims, um, and proof for acts of infringement, like producing, importing, putting to the market. Um, the defendant will do everything to defend himself, that's his right, and uh, this accumulates to the list we have on the right-hand side of the slide. So they will dispute the value in, of dispute, that, that would be too low, um, resulting, uh, if true, that the um, plaintiff would have to pay more court fee um, and of course more security for the cost uh, endorsement, which is uh, the second issue you could um, um, argue. Um, and then you could argue about the concentration of actions. So if somebody has more patents than one and wants to attack the same embodiment, he is um, obliged by law to do this in one only action. If he fails to do that, on objection of the defendant, uh, the later actions uh, could be um, s s striked out. Then, of course, we have the defense that we already have a license or we have exhaustion of the patent right, a private prior use defense, a statute of limitations if the um, plaintiff took too long to file, a fort feature. Uh, injunction not proportionate, amount of security for provisional enforcement not enough, uh, a motion for exception from the, the provisional enforcement, a stay of proceedings with view to a nullity action, a dolo agit defense, um, and of course then at last the compulsory license objection. And as you could see, it, when the court arrives at the objection, all the other issues brought forward by the defendant have proven to be not su uh, successful because it's not true what has been said or because it's not convincing or because it's wrong. Yeah. So the defendant failed to convince the court. Uh, I don't know how many points these are uh, in 15 points. And now he wants to convince the court in point 16 that he is really a willing licensee. This is a hard job, a very hard job, at least in Munich. So this objection is to be raised by the, the defendant and there are different kinds of objections. So we have the de facto standard um, which had been handled by the Federal Court of Justice in the decision standard barrel, standard barrel. And then we have a formal standard uh, situation had been handled in Orange Book. And then we have a, a friend declaration by the patent owner, which was um, decided by the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Federal Court of Justice as well. Um, in addition to that, we have the objections derived from the suppliers. And then we might have objections based on a contract. Um, but that's a kind of a theoretical scenario. Additional factors to take into account when these objections are brought forward in an infringement court, and especially in Germany, is that this is not the only thing we have to handle. Yeah, we have to go through the program I just showed you on the last slide. And there are additional factors making it even more difficult to handle these cases. We it will have motions for non-disclosure of it, um, facts. We will have number, numerous interveners, the suppliers, numerous briefs of all these peoples. 
numerous motions, pro and con inspection, inspection of time limits, rescheduled date for oral hearing, et cetera, et cetera. Numerous participants to the oral hearing, which, which is especially difficult in COVID-19 times, as we should uh, separate from each other physically, and not to stay too long together and breathe the same air and so on and so on. Uh, then we have professional public interest. Um, we have intervention by the federal cartel office and uh, of course the pandemic which not only makes it more difficult to conduct or a hearing to find a, a courtroom large enough to accommodate all people in COVID times but also uh, additional factors play into this problem as it, for example the um, judges if they have children and the, the schools or the kindergartens are closed and they have to care for these children at, at the same time prefer the case, which also is quite a challenge. So the basic requirements of this front objection is that we need to have a standard set by standard setting organization. The patent owner declared the patent as standard essential and has given a friend declaration to the standard setting organization. And please um, take note that we have different friend declarations. So the Etsy declaration is different from the IEEE declaration. Because of the SAP, the patent owner has a market dominant position in respect to the defendant. Uh, and of course, all this has to be um, pleaded and proved by the defendant as it's a, a, an objection by the defendant. A procedural, um, the defendant has to raise uh, this objection either by own right or derived from his suppliers. There must not be a procedural preclusion and pleading of proof lies with the defendant. And there is a little tricky extra to take into account that the defendant, most of the times before we arrive at this objections, pleaded that he does not use the patent TED technology. That the allegations that he would use are wrong, false. And now he has to plead exactly the opposite, that he desperately needs must use the technology because otherwise his products are not marketable. This is a kind of a contradiction which is legal in the German system, but if it's convincing is a second question. What is very important, um, especially the, the um, view we take in Munich, is that basic duties of any producing or importing company is to monitor the patent situation and to do an FTO analysis before entering the market. So you must not use patented technology without a license or another excuse. Um, if you act negligent and you, yeah, in most of cases, uh, this is assumed, you will be a patent infringer with all civil and criminal consequences. And there's no difference with the infringement of an SEP. There is no self-defense. The misuse of a market dominant position by the patent owner can lead to a right to counterclaim for damages, but not only for the time after a friend license offer by the defendant has been rejected. So this had been decided by the Federal Court of Justice in the first um, CISPEL versus Higher decision that there might be a counter right by the um, implementer um, if the patent owner misused his market dominant position uh, regarding the past damages for the past. 
but these damages will only be limited under two factors. First of all, we need a counter action. And secondly, this counter action will only be successful if we also have a counter offer, which is friend. So for the time after the rejection of this friend counter offer, the damages for the past will be limited to a friend license. The damages for the past before this point of time are not limited. So we have the damages as usual in the German system, um, um, infringes profit, uh, damages for the patent owner or license analogy. The EZJ invented the step-by-step -step regime. You might know it. There's the kind of a ping-pong situation. The patent owner has to give notice um, to the implementer of the patent infringement. Uh, then the um, patent infringer, the defendant, has to give a qualified, um, has to um, idea has to communicate a willingness to license. Then we need a friend offer by the patent owner, a written friend counter offer, a rejection of the counter offer. And if the use is going on, we need rendering of accounts and posting security by the defendant. And then we, of course, have the um, action um, calling for injunctive relief, recall, or destruction. So this scheme also only applies if the um, implementer later is defendant in an action directed to injunction, recall, and destruction. This scheme does not apply for um, suppliers who are not defendants, and it does not apply for um, infringers who are defendants, but the action is not directed to injunction and so on, but to damages. So you, as a patent owner, you can sue the defendant right away for damages without doing all anything of this ping pong uh, process. That would be uh, totally correct. Um, what is important to know is that the um, Federal Court of Justice um, specified uh, the requirements. Um, as he said, that the notice um, may be done with claim charts, but this is not mandatory. So it could even be less than claim charts. Um, the, the friend offer is to be explained, yet not with pieces of proof. And um, the Federal Court of Justice and the Munich courts very much concentrated on the willingness to take a license. So we need a serious request to this extent, no delay tactics, and an ongoing and focused participation in the negotiations. Um, in the case of a counter offer, that had to be friend and written. And very important, as most of the defendants use um, is going on, we need rendering of accounts and posting security. So what on earth is a willing licensee? Robin Jacob, um, a professor in, in, in Great Britain once said, a willing licensee is a man with a pen signing a license agreement. Of course, if we would have a license agreement, we would not have an infringement action anymore. Um, so it's a, a little bit less, but not much less. Uh, so we would ask ourselves, how would a party who really wants to conclude a license agreement as soon as possible behave in negotiations? And did the defendant behave like this? We have to keep in mind that the defendant is, at this point of time, as the court looks at the defense, a uh, infringer. And the infringement is going on every day. And the um, friend objection is kind of a remedy, an extraordinary remedy for the defendant to legalize his um, 
infringing activities and it could only be successful if the only reason why we do not have a license agreement is the unwillingness of the patentee. But before we look at the willingness of the patentee and if his offer is friend, we need a willing licensee, a willing defendant to license. And in all the cases we decided in, uh, in Munich, the defendant was not willing to this extent. So why is this so? Um, we have analyzed uh, the Court of Just Justice uh, of the European Union's judgment. And um, we have uh, the paragraph 66, which says, if the alleged infringer does not accept the offer made to him, he can only invoke the abusive nature of an injunction or recall action. If he makes a specific counter offer in writing to the owner of the SAP in question within a short period of time, that complies with the friend conditions. And we analyzed this very closely and came to the conclusion that the plaintiff's conduct in this scenario, including his offer, may be against competition law, may be an abuse of a market dominant position, but defendant cannot base his defense on that if he did not, what is said in 66. So the court will not look into the question whether or not the offer of the patent owner is friend if we have an unwilling licensee. And uh, paragraph 67 adds to all this that we also need, in the case of an ongoing infringement, the security and the rendering of accounts. And the Federal Court of Justice in the first decision um, referred to this um, European decision, especially in paragraph 82. But we have to read paragraph 81 first to understand this. Since appropriate conditions for a contractual relationship, in particular a reasonable price, are usually not objectively fixed, but can only be recorded as the result of possible similar negotiated market processes, the series and targeted participation of the company, the defendant, willing to license in the negotiation of appropriate contractual conditions is of decisive importance. And now comes number 82. This has to be considered in particular when examining the question of whether the infringer who has been sued from a patent can plead that the patent owner has not given him a license under friend conditions. And uh, to sum it up, uh, we have a look at 83. Rather, the infringer must, for his part, clearly and unambiguously declare that he is ready to conclude a license agreement with the patent owner on reasonable and non-discriminatory terms and must subsequently participate in the license agreement negotiations in a targeted manner. The High Court of England and Wales aptly put this in such a way that a willing licensee must be one willing to take a friend license on whatever terms are in fact friend. So we need a non-stop qualified willingness to license including a corresponding conduct in the negotiations and a corresponding content of the counter offers. We call all this together um, enables the court to come to the conclusion that in fact we have a willing licensee and the only reason why we don't, do not have a license agreement yet is the 
fact that the offer is not friend or the patent owner is not willing to license anyhow. And uh, quite important is uh, what uh, the Federal Court of Justice said in his first um, um, judgment that the lower court erred when it assumed that the defendants had agreed to conclude a license agreement on friend terms. So uh, the defendant um, it, it was higher in this case, was not a willing licensee. Um, the law court assumed that he was. And now comes 101. Also, this is not decisive. The law court assumption that the action constitutes an abuse of a dominant position of the plaintiff because the plaintiff has demanded discriminatory contractual conditions from the defendant is also wrong. Also, this is not decisive. This means that if we do not have a willing licensee, we do not have to look into the offer of the patent owner. Of course, we can look into the offer of the patent owner, but we don't have to. So the conclusions uh, we draw in Munich uh, are as such that the obligation of the court to evaluate the objection that the plaintiff's offer was not friend uh, only if after notice of infringement the following is shown by the defendant a serious unconditional qualified li willingness to license whatever it takes no delay tactics focused on ongoing participation a friend counter offer a security and rendering of accounts if defendant fails on any of these um, issues, uh, he will be injuncted without further examining whether or not we have a friend offer by the patent owner. The 21st um, division um, put this like this, ultimately from the point of view of an objective observer, the negotiation process must present itself as a serious determined process that is not based on tactical considerations, but on the recognizable will to achieve binding, fair and reasonable contractual conditions. As I pointed out before, the objection can also be examined and discharged if these conditions are not met by the defendant because the plaintiff's offer is in fact friend compliant or in any case is not comply is it's not compliance cannot be determined as the defendant bears the um, burden of pleading and proof so um, taking this into account the 21st division it had checked kind of obiter, whether the plaintiff's offer is obviously non-compliant to friend and they concluded that it was okay. In my opinion, an examination of the plaintiff's offer with the result non-compliant to friend and a partial dismissal of the action based on that finding would only be possible, however, it has been previously established that a defendant has successfully processed his catalog of duties, as pointed out the slide before. I often had been asked, uh, what exactly should the defendant um, counter offer? So which kind of counter offer could be friend compliant? Um, that's quite difficult uh, to answer. Um, basically, there are two ways to counter offer. The first counter offer would be a friend counter offer, and the second counter offer would be a counter offer based on section 315 of the German Civil Code. So, the German Civil Code in this uh, section provides this is the next slide um, a way to conclude a contract without specifying the details, especially the license fee. And 
when making an offer according to 315, the defendant would um, move the right to specify the conditions to the patent owner. The patent owner is then obliged to determine what license fee is to be paid. And as soon as he had done this, the contract is um, concluded with this determined license fee. And it has to be paid, the license fee. And accounts have to be rendered. Um, the defendant, however, has the right to go to court, um, bringing forward arguments that the determination by the patent owner is not equitable. And then the judge, if this was true, would set aside the determination by the patent owner and determine himself an equitable license fee. And all this would be um, in a court proceedings outside an infringement context because we have a license agreement and the infringement has ended. So that would be one example of a counteroffer or a sufficient counteroffer. But this is only true if the offer includes the right for the patent owner to determine the um, appropriate loss fee and that the defendant then has the burden to go to court. So we have seen it um, turned around that would not be sufficient. Is there a possibility to catch up in respect to the friend counter offer or any other uh, points we have uh, talked about, um, which the defendant has to uh, successfully conclude before the court is obliged to look into the offer by the patent owner. Um, uh, our court guidelines um, say that individual deficits can be remedied during the ongoing proceedings, in particular between the two oral hearings, in compliance with statutory or judicial deadlines. I like to point out that uh, the wording says individual deficits and um, the two divisions have handled with the, uh, these problems. And the first 21st division said, um, because the possibility of, of eliminating individual deficits should only benefit the honest party who is genuinely interested in negotiating a friend compliant license in accordance with the model required by antitrust law and who has genuinely and interested negotiated in a friend compliant manner and only an individual deficit if necessary of a corresponding reference by the trial judge has not yet been eliminated. However, this does not mean that the defendant can catch up on all negotiation steps at once, since otherwise the negotiating regime prescribed by the court of justice with which the conclusion of a license agreement on friend terms is to be achieved would be thwarted. And they uh, reasoned this also with reference to section 162 of the civil code. And this says uh, that um, if the satisfaction of a condition is brought about in bad faith by the party to whose advantage it would be, the condition is deemed not to have been satisfied. And this condition would be that we have one point of the many points to be concluded by the defendant. And if this is brought in too late by bad faith, the effect will not come in. So um, that's basically the reasoning. And uh, the seventh division has basically said the same. Um, Is there the possibility to 
of an antitrust compulsory license objections derived from the supplier. So the scenario would be that the defendant himself would not offer to license, but he refers to his suppliers and they offer to license. Um, that would be basically conceivable as the 21st division said, um, but only if the defendant wishes to obtain an own license. So the defendant could say that basically his suppliers should take the license and they are willing to take the license, but he still has to offer to take an own license. Um, an exclusion could be that the, these other suppliers are not named, um, that the defendant does not conduct inter parallel swift and determined negotiations. Um, that the suppliers have no own right to take or get a license agreement, but only have a right to access to the technology that is granted by the plaintiff's offer. Suppliers are not qualified, willing to license themselves, or suppliers have not submitted a friend offer and continued to use the technology also. No security has been provided and now accounts have been rendered, which had been um, handed down in Orange Book already. Uh, the suppliers are no defendant. So as they're no defendant, the regime, the ping pong regime of the Federal Court of the European Union um, is not to be applied. So they are just infringers. And so they are um, um, in a position that they can only successfully raise these objections via the defendant, their customer, when they have previously rendered accounts and posted a security. Uh, the seventh division said basically the same, but with one major difference. Uh, we said that if we have a defendant's counter offer, um, there is no longer the possibility to claim a derived um, license objection. Because with this counter offer, the defendant indicated that in the line of production, he or she is the right addressee of a license offer. Before I come to the proportionality of injunctive relief, uh, want to go back to the issue we I indicated before that we have to look at the friend um, declaration by the patent owner. Um, there are different wordings of friend declarations out there and they have to be looked at under different material laws. So we have the Etsy declaration, which is to be construed under French law. And we have the IEEE declaration that I think is to be construed under Swiss law. And um, in the decision of the seventh uh, division, we have uh, done this effort regarding the Etsy declaration and came to the conclusion that under French law, the Etsy declaration is not to be construed or to be understood as um, promising a license to all, but only access to all. That might be seen differently in the IEEE declaration, um, uh, but we have not looked at this because this was not subject of our decisions. An, an obligation by the patent owner to license the suppliers, however, could emerge if uh, he licensed other suppliers before. So this obligation would derive out of the antitrust um, obligations. Uh, but uh, this also has not happened in our cases. 
Now let's look at the proportionality of injunctive relief. Uh, this is also a very controversial issue at the moment. The federal government in Germany um, and the Bundestag are preparing to amend the law. And there are different um, opinions how to amend and if we get a specific amendment, what that would mean for the future of the injunctive relief in Germany. Um, but as the law is at the moment and as decided in the decisions I refer to, um, the examination of the proportionality um, will only ha happen after an objections by the debtor, by the defendant. The burden of pleading and proof lies with the debtor and it only will be successful in very exceptional cases. If the immediate enforcement of the injunction taking into account the interest of the patent owner and of the infringer would represent a disproportionate hardship, not justified by the exclusive right and would therefore be in breach of trust. Disproportionate hardship, not justified by the exclusive right. Strict standards are required. Objection will only be justified in very few exceptional cases. We need a careful consideration of all the circumstances of the individual case. A schematic solution is forbidden. And we have to take into account the overall concept of the patent law and the procedural structures in Germany. Um, we need to look, have a look at the behavior of the patent owner and his interest in the injunction, the economic effect of the patent infringer. For the patent infringer, the relationship between the subject matter of the patent and suit and the attacked may be complex product, the behavior of the infringer, the type and scope of infringement, hardships relevant beyond those which generally go hand in hand with an injunction. Infringer must take possible and reasonable precautions to avoid patent infringement. The infringer must apply for a license as early as possible. An infringer must begin to work on a design around as soon as possible, latest with receipt of the notice of infringement. And all this comes down in an actual decision by the 21st decision uh, division um, like this. Uh, the intervener, however, has not made any specific submissions as to why, as an exception, the injunction would be disproportionate. The disadvantage put forward by the intervener for the defendant that in the event of a conviction to cease and desist, that this defendant would have to conclude a license agreement under the conditions specified by the plaintiff in order to be able to remain on the market with its products does not per se constitute a reason to limit the right to cease and desist or otherwise sign the license agreement, defendant. <laughs> and um, quite the same it came out in the seventh division. I will not read this out now to have more time for discussion. The amount of security um, which has to be posted by the plaintiff, the successful plaintiff, before he could start the provisional enforcement of a first instant judgment is also very much under dispute. Uh, the basic rule is that this um, bond is to be as high as the possible damage that will be incurred due to the enforcement of the judgment this had, that had been declared provisionally enforceable until the existence of a decision by the higher regional court. And uh, as a rule of thumb, that will be about 18 months of enforcement. Um, of course, this could be a, a very high amount um, depending on the activities of the defendant. 
in the context of a friend objection, the both divisions have come to the following conclusions. So we have to ask ourselves, is it plausible that the defendant will actually refrain from using the patent and completely cease production and sales resulting in extremely high damages? Isn't it more likely and also necessary that he will sign the offered license agreement, maybe subject to a resolving condition or later terminate it? Wouldn't that be in line with the duty of the defendant to mitigate damages? For this, you have to know that if you ask for damages, you, the injured party, have to mitigate damages. So to the extent you did not follow this obligation, your um, claim would be reduced by the amount you could have avoided. And uh, so the reasoning uh, the two divisions took was that the defendant in our friend cases could have signed the offered license agreement. They didn't. Now they are injuncted. However, even after they have been injuncted, they could at any point of time sign the offered license agreement. The patent owner is still obliged to offer the license. And in fact, he is still willing to offer the same license. So the defendant could just sign it. And then we calculated the amount of license fees that will have to be paid for the 18 months until the high original court may judge otherwise. So this is the end of our presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, now I'm curious uh, whether you have any questions and I will happy to ask uh, to answer them, provided that I know the answer. Thank you very much.